hot. Good morning, Knox. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Exactly. Let's try that again. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Amen. So glad to see you. Good morning. Uh, my name is Anne, and I'm one of the worship leaders here at Knox. We are so glad to see you in the house of the Lord this morning. Please stand with me for the call to worship. It is good to praise the Lord and make music in his name. He is the most high. Let us proclaim his love in the morning and his faithfulness at night. Let us worship to the music of the drum and piano and the melody from our vocal cords. Let us sing for joy at the work of his hands and for by them he has made us glad. Let's pray together. Holy God, creator of all, the risen Christ taught from scripture of his death, resurrection, and ascension into your glorious presence. May the living Lord breathe on us his peace, that our eyes may be open to recognize him in breaking bread and to follow wherever he leads, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. All right, let's sing. Come, people of the risen King. You are invited to worship God today together. Shifting shadows of the earth, we will lift our eyes to Him. Where steady arms of mercy raise to gather the children in. Rejoice, rejoice! Let every tongue rejoice. One heart, one voice. O oh, Church of Christ, rejoice! Rejoice, rejoice. 
upon our single sacrifice to conquer every sting of that sin. Sing hallelujah. For joy awakes the stunning light when Christ's disciples lift her eyes. Alive they stand their friends and king. Christ, Christ it is risen. Christ is risen, he's risen indeed. Oh, sing hallelujah. Join the and with the redeemed, Christ is risen, is risen indeed. And God is what had been, they saw in their hearts believe. But blessed are those who have not seen, yet sing hallelujah. What's bound by fear, what's bound by fear, now hold in pain, they preach the truth. generations falling down in worship to sing the song of ages to the land all who come before us and all who we believe we sing the song of ages to the land your name your name is the highest your name the greatest your name stands above them all our thrones and dominions all powers and positions your name stands above them all and the angels cry holy all creation cry
dominions, all powers and positions, your name stands above them all. Jesus, your name is the highest, your name is the greatest, your name stands above them all. All thrones and dominions, all powers and positions. Good morning, church. It is so good to worship with you this morning. My name is Francis. I'm the pastor for kids, youth, and Knox camps. We are so glad that you are here this morning. I would love to invite any of the kids that we have in the service who are 10 and under to gather at the front. I'm going to pray for us before we head out. If this is your first Sunday here, we have two programs for kids, Tiny Tots for kids aged 1 to 4, and Knox Kids for kids aged 5 to 10. Um, we also ask if this is your first time and you are a caregiver of one of the children here that you come up and fill out a waiver for us just so we have all of their emergency contact information and any allergies we need to know about. I'm going to pray for us kids before we head out. Let's pray. God, we thank you for life, for sunshine and rain, for the beauty of your creation, how the heavens proclaim that beauty. We thank you for your words of comfort and promise and as we learn more about your great love for us and for the world, Jesus, would you help us to spread your love to others with the words that we use and in the ways we care for our neighbors and this world. In Jesus' name, amen. As we move into confession, um, let us stand and sing because he lives together. So stand with me. Join the one that never ends. 
be seated. Yes, we are alive because Jesus lives, and we proclaim this life-altering truth and find hope for each day. However, we do not always completely live in accordance to this reality. So let us turn to God uh, in a prayer of confession. So join me. God of mercy, you have called us to be thankful for your good gifts to us, but too often we have taken them for granted as if we deserve them. You have called us to be hopeful through the gospel of Jesus Christ, but too often despair has come upon us and the cares of the world have weighed us down. You have called us to be joyful in the wonder of your presence among us, but too often we become marred in the mundane and lose the gift of reverence. By your saving power, O God, enable us to celebrate your love for us with joy and thanksgiving. Amen. The mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. In fulfillment of the promises of God, I declare to you, in the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. All glory be to God. Amen. Dearly loved ones, God's love and remain with us. Since we have been redeemed and reconciled to God in Christ, let us share the sign of peace with one another. We can do that by saying the peace of Christ be with you and also with you. So I invite you all to stand and offer a sign of peace with one another. All right, I am back here again. <laughs> okay, so I am clearly not Sam Moody of Popula. She's lost her voice, so today you will have me. Um, yes, but welcome. We are a church that is following Jesus, loving the city, and serving the world. Wherever you are in your faith journey, you are welcome here. If you are new to Knox, we'd love you to become a part of what God is doing here. So if you're ready to join in, Share some details with us through our welcome form in the bulletin that you may have received when you came in. Uh, or you could look at the QR code that's in front of your pew and scan that, and there should be more information for you there. Um, today, I have some announcements for you. After worship, we have soup. So please join us for a time of fellowship. Um, we have a wonderful team. Sydney and his team are working hard to provide you a nice meal, so please do come and enjoy that. Last week of Alpha, we, okay, last week of Alpha is this coming Wednesday. And so um, please keep praying. It's been really amazing to see our volunteers and staff create a space um, for people to explore the faith. And so we've been seeing and hearing quite encouraging things. And so God is moving. And so this is really great. And so hopefully in the coming weeks, you guys will get to hear some stories. Yes. Next, we also have worship team day. It's a day of connecting, praying, and training for our AV and worship team members. But if you are interested in joining these teams and serving God in this sanctuary, this is a great place to start. So if you're interested, please email Pastor Tamika. You could find her email in the bulletin or on our website. And in the next 
announcement, we have Wendy is retiring from her role at the end of April. So please mark in your calendar, Sunday, April 28th, save that date. We will be celebrating her. Um, she's not leaving us, but she'll be transitioning to becoming a regular congregant with us to worship. Um, so we're thankful for her many years of service with us here. And a few more notes, uh, if you don't want to miss more information and what's going on in our community, please do refer to the bulletin or go to knoxtoronto.org slash links. Um, but the best part of my announcement just for today is that I get to introduce our Knox camp director. And this is Joshua hudson Kajuru. so I invite you to come up. Yay! <laughs> So this is Joshua hudson Kudu, and we had put out a notice to look for a director in December sometime last year, and we've been praying, and then February came, and we were getting desperate. And so I don't know if you guys read the weekly email. We were like, oh my goodness, are we going to get a director? What do we do? Um, but thankfully, Joshua came in time. The Lord provided him. And so I would just love to take a moment to just ask a few questions so you could get to, get to know him a little bit. So get ready. Okay. All right. Joshua, tell us a little bit about yourself, where you grew up, and what brought you to Toronto. Like, praise the Lord, everyone. Um, like, my name is Joshua. Um, I was raised and born in, back in India, so... I've completed my bachelor's in India, so I came to Toronto for, to further my education. And if it's God's will, I would like to settle down in Canada. We love that God's will had Toronto in mind for you. Yes, welcome to Toronto. And um, just in maybe two, two to three sentences, why is camp important? Um, um, like as in Proverbs 22.6, like, like when the child is like early age, if he we set him in a good way, he won't depart from it. So I believe that if the children are exposed to the word of God at the early age, though they may sleep, they always have the back home, back way to God. So I'm as the testament for the camp because I was the beneficiary for the camp. Yeah, what a testimony. We're so glad you're here and that our, our incoming kids would also hear the word of God. Yeah. Um, third question here for you. What are you most excited about camp at Knox this year? Yeah. Uh, although I have the like, experience with the kids' ministry or, uh, after I went into the youth ministry, but like, I w I'm really thrilled to get back to the kids because of their super transparent emotions. And like, after I'm getting to know about the Knox history in camps, I feel so privileged to work mm. here and I'm like really excited to have fun and to make beautiful memories with the kids. Oh, so wonderful, thanks. And your final question is, how can we pray for you as you prepare for camp? Um, yeah, pray for me for, to balance my education as well as the employment and pray for the registrations as it's live right now and pray for the hiring a lot of camp staff and pray for God's guidance for me and May God uses me for the benefit of camp and for his glory. Okay. Could I just take a quick moment to pray for you, Joshua? Yep. Okay. Let me go. Uh, Father God, we thank you so much for providing Joshua here for us. We thank you that he has an answer to prayer and that you have prepared the children to come to and our staff. And so, God, um, surprise us, Lord, and get, fill us with hope, knowing that you care for us and love us. And so, as registrations are open, I pray that people would see it and um, be moved to register, Lord God. And I pray that a good team would come together in time so that they could really bond and um, really live out your vision here, Lord God, and have a fun time, create good memories, and um, yeah, have transparent moments too, Lord God, that really lead them to uh, honestly bring themselves to you, Lord God. Thank you so much um, for Knox Camps. Thank you for Joshua. Give him continued wisdom and discernment uh, as he uh, manages this role, Lord God. Thank you, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Let's continue to worship. And with me, and we'll sing at the cross, Lauren Red. Please stand. 
Church. My name is Paul, and we'll be reading this morning from be reading this morning from the book of Luke, uh, chapter twenty-four, starting at verse thirteen. Luke twenty-four. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them named Cleopas asked him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened here in these days? What things, he asked, 
about Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped he was the one that was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. He said to them, How foolish you are, and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going farther. But they urged him strongly, Stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, It is true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was, re was recognized by them when he broke the bread. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning. My name is Alex and I serve as senior minister here at Knox and I want to add my word of welcome to what Anne said at the beginning of the service and then Christine said, we're glad you're here today. It's good to worship God together. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask you to show us how to live. We ask you today to guide us we're coming from all sorts of different circumstances, but many of us are unsure about what to do next. And so we trust you, Holy Spirit, that you, as you point us to Jesus through your word, that you will show us the way we need to go. So would you come and encourage us today? Come alongside us, we pray in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Christ is risen. We say that on Easter Sunday, don't we? And if you're familiar with church, it's likely you've heard it before on that occasion. But then often we stop saying it. So we're going to keep saying it because Easter is not just one day. It's a season. And in fact, every Sunday we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. It's at the very core of our faith. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. So today we start a new series that is focused on the resurrection, a series we're calling Surprised by Hope. Over the next five Sundays from now until Pentecost, we're going to look at what happened to the disciples as they came to grasp the truth in a personal way that Jesus really had risen, that he is risen indeed in the flesh, in history. The first thing is that they were very surprised. They did not expect Jesus to rise from the dead, even though he had told them he would. And there are all kinds of reasons why that caught them by surprise. We'll get into over the coming weeks. But we, as we read these accounts, may be tempted to assume that first century people were unenlightened or that they were prone to superstition, that they're not sophisticated and scientific like us. But if we're thinking that way, we're guilty of what C.S. Lewis called chronological snobbery. 
the idea that the worldview of an earlier period in history is inherently inferior to that of the present. The reality is that first century people were just as skeptical as we are. A different frame of reference in terms of science technology, to be sure, but all the disciples had to be convinced. They were completely surprised by the resurrection, but in a really good way. If the death of Jesus had plunged them into despair, his return to them, risen from the dead and alive, well, that invoked incredible joy, and it filled them with a hope that they had never known before. Hope for everything and hope for everyone. You can think of it this way. At the end of The Lord of the Rings, the hobbit Sam Gamgee discovers that his friend, Gandalf the wizard, had not died as he thought. He'd seen him die, but instead that Gandalf was actually alive. And so when he discovers this amazing thing, he says to Gandalf, I thought you were dead, but then I thought I was dead myself. Is everything sad going to come untrue, he asks. And the answer Christian faith has for that question is yes, emphatically yes. Everything sad is destined to come untrue. And it will even be more glorious because once it was broken and lost. That is the hope of the resurrection. That is the core of the gospel. That is what every day when we wake up as followers of Jesus, we cling to. It is the bedrock of who we are. And we're going to explore what it means, its implications for our lives throughout this series, starting with two disciples walking along the road to Emmaus in Luke 24. Have you ever had some things stare you right in the face and you still did not see it? I had an experience like that when I lived in China. I was traveling by train from Beijing to Shanghai. It was a very hot day and the train was crowded. Still, all the windows were tightly shut. At that time in China, people had a strong aversion to drafts or breezes because some thought that you get sick that way. Now, I didn't want to be an obnoxious foreigner, but I really wanted some fresh air. So I looked directly at the woman sitting across from me and asked permission to open the window. May I open the window? I asked in Mandarin after six months of language study. She did not respond. I asked again, may I open the window, please? Without blinking, the woman looked over at her friend next to her and said, isn't it fascinating how foreign, language, foreign languages so resemble our mother tongue? <laughs> I turned to my Chinese friend whom I was traveling with, and I asked him in English if my tones and my pronunciation had been correct. He assured me that I'd asked to open the window in perfect Chinese. Sometimes we hear, but we do not understand. We see at one level, but we do not perceive the truth of what is really happening. Here in Luke 24, we watch on as Jesus encounters two of his followers and they do not recognize him. There's a sequence throughout this passage that leads to the big reveal. First, these two disciples are in a place of confusion and consternation in the wake of Jesus' death. But then Jesus steps in. Jesus offers correction. He addresses the ways that they've misunderstood Scripture. Next, they experience a turning point, this amazing conversion when he breaks bread with them and they recognize him. And finally, they go away and reflect on it in community. They coalesce around it in community as they travel back to the city and as they unpack it with their friends in Jerusalem. Their hope was built on Jesus as he led them into a surprising and wonderful new future. And ours can be too. In Luke 24, we meet two followers of Jesus on the road to Emmaus, a village near Jerusalem. It says seven miles from Jerusalem. 
And in a footnote for us Canadians, it tells us that that's 11 kilometers. It's the third day since Jesus was executed, and they're deep in discussion about what had taken place. Jesus joins them, but they don't recognize him. It even says they were kept from recognizing him. Jesus asks, what are you talking about? They stop, their faces downcast. Why include that detail? I think to highlight, to make sure we realize these two are broken. They are absolutely heartbroken. Their hope for the future has been crushed by the one thing that no one can escape and which our culture goes to such extraordinary lengths to deny, and that is death. One of the two is identified by the name Cleopas. That detail also may seem innocent, but it points to the claims of eyewitnesses who saw Jesus alive, who could have been tracked down when this gospel was written, and who were known in the first century church as the ones to whom Jesus had appeared. Cleopas can't believe Jesus hasn't heard the news about himself, the news about his own death. And so you start to see this is pretty funny, or at least ironic. I imagine Luke must have had fun writing this. Jesus doesn't let on who he is, but he asks, what things? And so they describe Jesus as a great prophet who preached the most incredible sermons and who healed people and turned their lives around. But they don't call him Lord. No, they call him dead. And they admit they'd hoped he was going to be the one to redeem Israel and lead his people to freedom. Most of all, they're confused. They trusted Jesus and he let them down. Maybe you can relate to that. Have you ever pinned your hopes on someone and been disappointed? Friends fail to meet our expectations. They don't show up when we need them. Or we may feel like they've betrayed us. Perhaps for you, it's a mentor or a leader. Your parents in some way. Someone who promised and who did not deliver. We're only human after all, right? We always seem to let each other down in the end. And pretty soon, we're all on the way to being totally cynical. We won't get fooled again. Meet the new boss, same as the old boss. Maybe you can't really trust anyone. That, I think, is the de default position for many of us in our practical everyday lives. And then in the wider world, we're dealing with confusion and darkness on a larger scale. As drones and missiles rain down on Israel last night, and as we wait for the inevitable response of more violence and death, we're asking, how can there ever be peace and justice in Gaza, in Ukraine, in Sudan? Or on the road to where you live as you head home later today? passing the greatest disparity in wealth this city has ever known. From people without homes to people with way, way more than they need. Where's the hope for a future in which you flourish when so many can't even find housing they can afford? But on the road to Emmaus, there was more to the story than confusion. Earlier in this chapter, the women did not find the body of, the, of Jesus. Instead, they saw angels who said he was alive. And so the two, the two disciples described those events to this stranger who's come alongside them. Then they recount how their friends, the men, went and they also did not see Jesus. That last line again is loaded with irony. Did they not see Jesus? You want to reach into the page, right into the story and shake them saying, Guys, he's right there. He's right there walking with you, right in front of you. And Jesus may have felt something similar because he now changes his approach. No more innocent questions. Now he addresses their confusion with a generous dose of correction. 
He calls them foolish and slow to believe. Not because they hadn't figured out on their own that he had risen, but because they had misunderstood their Bibles and all the prophets had said. That little three-letter word, all, is central to what's going on here. All the prophets had spoken. All the scriptures, it's repeated. Now, these two disciples were believers. They knew the Hebrew Bible, but they had failed to grasp the big picture, even though Jesus had taught them again and again. They only believed one side of the story. The story of the Messiah as a triumphant king, as a conqueror and ruler of his people, as one whose freedom, as one whose victory would free them from oppression, would restore the pride of Israel and return them to power. They had viewed Jesus as that kind of king, but then it all went horribly wrong. They were so caught up in their idea of the good life, what God should do for them, in a way what he owed them, that they were blind to the possibility that his purposes might be different, even that God's glory could come through suffering and death. Jesus had not hidden them, hidden this from them as he does not hide it from us. He had not sugarcoated his message or tried to make it easy for his followers, the way the church has often been tempted to market Christianity with entertainment and the promise of prosperity. No, Jesus had said, if you follow me, you're going to take up your own cross too. You're going to suffer. What did we sing earlier? All thrones and dominions, all powers and positions, your name stands above them all. Well, Jesus doesn't appear here above these two. He doesn't descend from heaven as the risen Christ. He doesn't even come riding on a horse as someone with any wealth, any status in that society would have. No, he walks with them in the dust, in the dirt. He lowers himself. It's through suffering that Jesus says, you will come to know me, to know the truth of my resurrection. In verse 26, he cuts to the heart of it when he asks, did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter into his glory? That's what they were missing. That's partly why they couldn't recognize him. And so Jesus explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine having Jesus right there with you, going through the whole Bible? Would that not rock your world? Do you think your grasp of Scripture might improve as a result? Not just Bible knowledge, but the big picture of the Gospel. Even more, would your heart not be moved by that experience? That's Jesus right now, risen among us, inviting you to see his word as the road he's waiting to walk along with you. I remember a few years ago, a friend of mine was trying to push back against what he described as his children's screen addiction. He had gotten them iPhones when they were 12. He regretted it. One time when he took away his daughter's phone, she was so angry at him, and then she burst into tears and she said, my life is on that phone. Some words reveal more than others. What is your relationship with technology? Is your life on your phone? What do you reach for? First thing in the morning, what do you reach for when you wake up? In John 6, earlier in the story of Jesus, many of his followers left him. And he asked the rest of them if they were going to leave too. And Peter answers, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Jesus still fires up our hearts, still gives us the words of eternal life, still awakens us to his presence in the world, still opens up the scriptures to us. The Holy Spirit is waiting to point each one of us to Jesus as you open your Bible each day. And Luke 24 leaves no doubt that God wants to renew us with his hope and he will meet us 
as we seek him in his word. And so when you grasp the fullness of the gospel, the living reality of the good news of God's love shown to us in Jesus Christ, it starts to change everything. C.S. Lewis, after he became a Christian, wrote these words. I believe in Christianity as I believe that the sun has risen, not only because I see it, but because by it, I see everything else. As God enlightens us with all of his truth, starting with his revelation in scripture, we are transformed by the renewing of our minds in every area of our life. Through his death on the cross and in the hope of the resurrection, Jesus insists that we change our minds about what's important in our lives. He illuminates every corner, every discipline, every field, every line of work. Jesus says, how are you practicing resurrection where you live? Among the people I've put you with, how are you doing it today? And so Jesus explains the whole Bible to these two disciples, the all of the gospel. But strangely, they still don't recognize him. They were confused and he offered correction. So why don't they know him yet? Because they needed the conversion. And that only happens by the grace of God. You can't reason your way to God, even when you have Jesus as your own personal Bible study leader. These two disciples don't grasp the truth in their minds because of corrected theology and then see Jesus as a result. First, they need God to open their eyes. Only then could they recognize their Lord. In French, there are two words for knowing, savoir and connaître. Savoir means knowing about something. Connaître, on the other hand, refers to personal knowledge, knowing people. You can know a lot about God, about the Bible, but until God reveals himself, you will not truly know him. Maybe you were brought up in the Christian faith. Maybe you come to church faithfully. But Jesus is saying here that you won't really know him. You will not recognize him until he gives you what you need and that only he can do that. How does it happen here? Well, in the most mundane, the most ordinary way you could possibly imagine. In a meal, by the breaking of bread. Most of you have already had one meal today. I hope you have. My grandmother used to say breakfast was the most important meal of the day. And I skipped it way too often when she told me that. Maybe you just had a muffin this morning on your way out the door. I'm guessing you're probably already anticipating lunch. When we eat, I think it's the very definition of mundane. It's every day. Mundane means of the world. It means secular. It means ordinary. It means apart from holy, special things. And yet we know that meals matter greatly. Our most meaningful relationships with friends and family happen over meals. And so Jesus here, I think, is making it clear he's not going to take us away from all of that into a kind of super spiritual life, into a religious cul-de-sac, an enclave where we're safe and stuck. No, right in the thick of those relationships, over a meal, in the messiness and complicated nature of our friendships, in their brokenness, in the everyday struggles and conflict. He gives us the grace we need so that we can truly live. He gives us the grace to leave behind our fear and sorrow, that place those disciples had been stuck, and he frees us up to love others and to serve them. You may know this meal on the road to Emmaus is one of a series of meals in scripture. The feeding of the 5,000 is another. The Last Supper, we reflected on recently. Most of all, this meal points to what we call communion or the Lord's Supper. 
We know Jesus in the breaking of the bread because he was broken for us. Jesus gave his life as the perfect sacrifice for our sins and so that death could be defeated. It's only by his grace that he has chosen us and opened our eyes to who he is. Now, if you don't see Jesus like that today, if you have not been captivated, moved, and transformed by his love and by his beauty, then I hope you will not leave here today without resolving to open the door to him in some way this week. If the resurrection is true, if the resurrection might be true, if the resurrection is good news worth considering, are you willing to give God a chance to show you something new, to show you something better than what you have in your life right now? Are you willing to pin some hope on him and then wait to see what happens next? We've moved with these two disciples from confusion through correction to this amazing conversion moment. And now we come to the community of faith that begins to form around the hope of that first Easter morning. Why does Jesus disappear from their sight? I think because he's going to be with them in a different way in the future now. His presence will be real, but it will be spiritual. It will no longer be in the flesh. I love the way these two friends on the road to Emmaus start to work it out together. They remember the presence of Jesus as they head back to the city and they unpack what happened. They ask this question, were not our hearts burning within us? And they get up and go. They find the other disciples and they tell their story. That right there is the church. If you want a picture of the church, you have it here in Luke 24. That is where the love will grow and the hope will deepen as those stories are exchanged and as the Holy Spirit comes and sends them out. That is where there will be healing, forgiveness, and restoration. God promises all of that to those of us who make his church, our home. Here at Knox, we want to be more like that. We want to recognize Jesus more and more among us. We want more of the friendship that grows when we read God's word and pray together. When Jesus sends us out to share the hope he's given us and to break bread and to offer that bread to others, especially those who are hungry, those who are lonely, those who are in need. In Matthew, Jesus says, where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there. Do you have that experience of Christian community in your life right now? Maybe the first step would be for you to join us for soup lunch after today's service, or to join us the next time in a month, or to scan the bulletin and see where you could get involved. You could talk to me about that or Christine after the service. There's a part of the New Testament where the Apostle Paul writes in a letter to a church that was really having a hard time. He writes about the resurrection and he writes about how Jesus overcame sin and defeated death at the cross. And he starts that chapter, 1 Corinthians 15. He starts it off by listing all the people to whom Jesus appeared on that first Easter and in the days that followed. That story is still being told. Jesus died for our sins, was buried and raised on the third day. He appeared to Peter and to the Twelve. He appeared to Cephas, among others. And today in downtown Toronto, he is revealing himself to many of us. That has been my favorite part of the Alpha Course, really the Alpha community that has gathered on Wednesday nights for the past 12 weeks. It's been hearing about all the epiphanies, this word we use for when a light goes on, when we see something. The stories about people feeling welcomed into a community over a meal. I believe Jesus is walking with you today. He wants you to recognize that he is real and that he loves you. He knows you. 
He made you. And the way you are going to find yourself is by finding him. He says to you and to all of us, I am the resurrection and the life. He went to the cross to give you ultimate hope, the hope you can build a life on, hope that you can change, hope that you have changed, hope that your sins are forgiven, hope that you are made new and that death itself is defeated. And so we say, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. A couple of questions for you to reflect on as you consider how you might respond to God's word today. First of all, how are you looking for Jesus in the scriptures? Secondly, how are you coming to recognize him more and more in the community of his church? Matthew 6, 19 through 21 says, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. Offering is a practice of our church because Jesus tells us that the things we treasure have our hearts. So we freely give worldly treasures, certain that the heavenly treasures we have heard proclaimed to us once more are richer by far and more deserving of our attention and care, even as we faithfully steward every good gift. Through our offerings, we express our gratitude and reliance on God. So for those of you who are guests with us today, please don't feel obligated to give. We're eager to share with you more about our church and its ministry and to invite you to participate with us as you are called by God. To give today, you can text GIVE to 647-931-3570. You could also use the envelopes in the pew and place them in the box after worship or as uh, the ushers come by with the offering plates. Or you could again visit knoxtoronto.org slash give for more giving options. Uh, so join me in prayer for the offering. Lord Jesus Christ, you offered yourself for the sake of the world. Receive, we pray, these gifts in our very lives, that even as your giving led to glorious joy, so our gifts might be used to bring the promise of new life to our city and to the ends of the earth. We ask this in your name. Amen.
Join me now in the prayers of the people. Loving God, in Jesus Christ, you teach us to pray and to present our petitions to you in his name. Guide us by your Holy Spirit that our prayers for others may serve your will and show your steadfast love for all. Gracious God, you have called together a people to be the church of Jesus Christ. As our church continues to hold the elder domination process, please give us your discernment. May your people be one in faith and discipleship, breaking bread together and telling good news so that the world may believe you are love, turn to your ways, and live in the light of your truth. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Creator God, you made all things and called them good. We thank you for the spaces we inhabit and the spaces of hospitality we have been able to extend to those who seek your peace and goodness. May your planet Earth be held in reverence by all people. May its resources be used wisely and its fragile balance between life and death respected. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Eternal ruler, in your mighty realm, the nations rise and fall. We hear of kidnappings and killings, missiles and attacks, threats and increasing terror. Hear our prayers for those who govern, that they may learn wisdom and truth, establish justice and mercy, and seek the ways of peace. We ask that your kingdom would come. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Emmanuel, God with us, Meet us in our illnesses and sufferings. Heal our bodies and minds and hearts that are in need of recovery, renewal, and restoration. For those of us who are stressed with this season of examinations and pressure to find jobs, may you give us success and remind us that our worth is found not in our grades or economic or status or social status, but in our belovedness in you. And as Joshua and Francis search for staff for Knox camps, we ask for your provision in your beautiful time. May we tangibly experience how your love remains with us and woos us to yourself, even in our weaknesses and worries. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Eternal God, ruler of all things in heaven and earth, accept the prayers of your people and strengthen us to do your will through Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Alex, for bringing that word to us today. And to know that as we leave, sometimes we forget that God is with us. He always is with us. He never leaves us or forsakes us. And part of the reason why we join together each Sunday is to be reminded. That's how Jesus shows up in our community, not just on Sunday mornings, but throughout the week, to remind ourselves, God is with you. God is with me. Um, and the sending song that we're going to be singing um, has three phrases that I love. It says, a reminder, to this I hold, my hope is only Jesus. To this I hold, my shepherd will defend me. And to this I hold, my sin has been defeated. So let us sing, rise together, sing and remind ourselves and each other of these sentences that God will never leave us or forsake us. The gift of grace is Jesus my Redeemer. There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. Shaken. For by my side, the Savior, He will stay. I labor on in weakness and rejoicing. 
For in my name His power is displayed To this I hold My shepherd will defend me Through the deep His body will lead Oh, the night has been won And I shall overcome Yet not I But through Christ in me Just a reminder that we are having soup lunch today and you would be welcome to join us. You can get to the room with the soup through either one of these doors. Now go in peace and may the loving kindness of God our Father, may the corrective truth and the grace-filled friendship of his son Jesus, and may the guidance and the encouragement of the Holy Spirit be with you this day, in the week ahead, and forevermore. God bless you. We'll see you next Sunday. Seems so hard to bear.